Judging by the title of this video, you know there's a heavy thing being said about Francis. Worse than usual. Archbishop Carlo Maria Viganò has been very busy as of late, putting out a string of videos where he makes messages for the laity. I suspect that he moved to do the video format after it was insinuated that Taylor Marshall, of all people, was writing his English language letters for him, to which his actual translators responded with statements saying how absurd that was. Since that time, Viganò has put out at least a dozen of these messages that you can watch for yourself. But in one, he says that Francis has broken his oath to the Jesuits to never seek out a formal position in the church, and if offered to resist the offer to his last breath, unless the offer of a position was made by a sitting pontiff. It's a heavy thing to say, and Viganò went and said it. So let's go over the story, and let's start with something that Francis himself said that lends credibility to what Viganò was saying. It came out this week that Francis was chosen for the papacy by his peers that are associated with the St. Gallen group. That's not news at all, but Francis said this about the work and aims of his papacy. Mark Lambert writing over at De Omnibus de Dubitandum Est, apologies for my bad and butchered Latin there. Well, he hits us with this, though. Quote, At the beginning of September, in a radio interview with Spanish radio Cope, the Pope made an underreported comment relating to the discussions which took place between the cardinals before the conclave, which chose him. Pope Francis explicitly confirmed that the current reform of the church is part of an agenda that was programmed and decided before the 2013 conclave by a small group of cardinals. The reform is what the cardinals wanted from the conclave of March 2013, Pope Francis insists. I did not invent anything. My action since the beginning of the pontificate consists in achieving what we, the cardinals, had requested in the pre-conclave meetings for the future pope. The next pope will have to do this, this and that, and that is what I have started to implement. I think there are still various things to be done, but there is no invention on my part. I obey what was decided at the time. The Pope argues that some of those who supported his elevation, siding with the most obvious reformers, would not have accepted the full measure of the consequences of their commitment. Perhaps some did realize the significance of what they were saying, or did not imagine the consequences, as it is true that certain themes are disturbing, but there is no originality on my side in the plan implemented. The pontiff emphasizes, stating clearly, that the reform which is taking shape sums up what we cardinals were saying at the time. End quote. Think about what he just said. We know for a fact that then Cardinal Bergoglio was chosen by several cardinals first in 2005 and again in 2013 for the papacy, and I've done videos on this in the past. And now we have from his own lips that Francis is operating according to a program designed by the men who chose him. It's incredible stuff, and no one talked about it at the time, including me. It's just incredible. The thing we focus on here, though, is, be is his being chosen for the papacy by a group of men, not because it might violate the code of canon law regarding how conclaves are run, that's been covered by other people ad nauseum, but because of something else almost no one ever brings up. Vigano called Francis a breaker of oaths in one of his early tapes that I referenced at the start of this, and I'm going to let him speak for himself on this. To quote him, Archbishop Vigano, in his own words, at the end of tape three, we get this, quote, It seems to me that in this secretive plan, the role of the Jesuit had been decisive. It is no coincidence that for the first time in history, a religious of the Society of Jesus is seated on the throne of Peter in violation of the rule established by St. Ignatius of Loyola, end quote. Now, what rule is that precisely? We need to know more what he's talking about because it's a heavy accusation to make against him, and Vigano does not actually elaborate on what he means, at least in that tape. Stephen O'Reilly at the blog Roma Locuta Est says this on this topic, quote, Tape 3 ends on that note. Whether Tape 4 expands on that comment or not, I don't know. However, for some context as to the rule violation spoken of above, each fully professed Jesuit, thus including Jorge Bergoglio S.J., has taken the following oath. I also promise that I will never strive for or ambition any prelacy or dignity outside the society, and I will, to the best of my ability, never consent to my elevation unless I am forced to do so by obedience to him who can order me under penalty of sin. End quote. This is an interesting question, and Mr. O'Reilly three years ago did a post looking into it. But before that, let's take a little closer look to the vow then Father Bergoglio would have taken. The Jesuit Constitution states rather clearly in Article 817 that the Jesuits are not to seek the episcopacy, meaning the office of bishop, at all. In fact, if one is seeking the episcopacy, his brother priests are to report him to their superior. It says the following, quote, It will also be of the highest importance toward perpetuating the society's well-being to use great diligence in precluding from it ambition, the mother of all evils, in any community or congregation. This will be accomplished by closing the door against seeking 
directly or indirectly, any dignity or prelacy within the church, in such a way that all the professed should promise to God our Lord never to seek one, and to expose any one whom they observe trying to obtain one, also in such a way that one who can be proved to have sought such a prelacy becomes ineligible and disqualified for promotion to any prelacy. The professed should similarly promise to God our Lord not to seek any prelacy or dignity outside the society, and as far in them lies, not to consent to being chosen for a similar charge unless they are compelled by an order from the one who can command them under pain of sin. Each one should desire to serve souls in conformity with our profession of humility and lowliness, and to avoid having the society deprived of the men who are necessary for its purpose. End quote. We'll come back to that in a moment, because there's more there that's relevant, but it's pretty clear. St. Ignatius of Loyola considered ambition to office to be the mother of all sins, at least for priests. Why? Because while ambition is fine, if it is right-ordered and directed towards honoring God, ambition to seek office in the church is a wicked thing. Men are called by their superiors and by God to such offices. They are not to be sought out like a cheap secular office. Think of the enormous damage that can be done to the faith and to the salvation of souls by wicked men in the episcopacy. I mean, really, all you have to do is l watch a few of the videos that I've done and you'll see what I mean. We're all too familiar with this. This is a serious rule that St. Ignatius of Loyola put into place, and he had very good reasons for doing so. It's also worth remembering that as wicked men being in the episcopacy goes, the era leading to the chaos caused by men like Luther and Calvin were all made possible, at least in part due to wicked men who were in offices they should not have been in, most notably, of course, being the Borgia popes like Alexander VI. Which brings us back to this, from that original article by Mr. O'Reilly, quote, now it may very well be the case that Vigano's reference to the violation of the rule of St. Ignatius above was simply a casual aside. However, it is still an interesting question. Roma Locuta Est has taken a detailed look into the very interesting question of this Jesuit vow and its potential implications for the validity of Cardinal Bergoglio's acceptance of his elevation to the papacy. End quote. He then links to this article that looks at who could have waived the argument. Before even looking at this with you, I'm going to suggest only two people alive could have waived this for Father Bergoglio, the superior general of the Jesuits, and Pope John Paul II. No one else on earth would have had the authority to do so. But let's take a look first at the Constitution of the Jesuits before we get back to Mr. O'Reilly. The Constitution of the Jesuits says this, quote, Each one should further promise to God our Lord that if a prelacy outside the society is accepted through the aforementioned of compulsion, he will afterwards listen at any time to the counsel of whoever may be general of the society, or of another whom the general substitutes for himself, and that if he judges the counsel he has received to be the better thing, he will carry it out. He will do this not because he, being a prelate, has any member of the society as a superior, but because he wishes to oblige himself under voluntarily before God our Lord to do what he finds to be better for his divine service, and to be happy to have someone who presents it to him with charity and Christian freedom to the glory of God our Lord. End quote. In other words, should a priest be compelled to become a bishop or higher, he must listen to the superior general of the Jesuits, which means that under certain circumstances, a Jesuit becoming a bishop of a diocese puts that diocese under de facto rule by the Jesuits. I doubt every, anyone ever considered the possibility of a Jesuit pope at the time this was drafted, but feel free to think about the implications of that for a second. Which brings us back to Mr. O'Reilly in his article from three years ago. Now let's see his take. First, he points to someone who is familiar to longtime subscribers of my channel, Father John Harden, who was himself a Jesuit. He gave us this hint, quote, The third vow, besides the solemn vow, is to never seek or accept, unless under formal obedience and pain of mortal sin from the Pope, any dignity in the office. We are forbidden under pain of mortal sin to become bishops. In the fourth vow, to protect the third, we are bound under sin to resist every effort to advance us in the church. End quote. In other words, only the Pope can force a Jesuit to accept the office of being a bishop, and they are required on pain of mortal sin to resist further advancement, meaning no becoming an archbishop or cardinal for the Jesuit in question unless under pain of mortal sin due to disobedience to the Pope, who is demanding it, and that's the only time if it comes into question. But if there's no Pope, like in the case of a conclave, what then? In theory, if the bishops pressure the Jesuit in question enough, he could accept the call, but that's the thing. All the reporting on the conclave says that then Cardinal Bergoglio never one time resisted the offer to serve. And recall that in 2005, he narrowly lost to Cardinal Ratzinger at the conclave. So if Bergoglio never resisted the call as Jesuits should, if he willingly and gladly accepted the offer of the papacy, as has been widely reported, then what? 
Mr. O'Reilly reports that many Jesuits in 2013 were shocked by the elevation of a Jesuit to the papacy. Utterly shocked by it, since, as one says, Jesuits are trained to think of themselves as servants of the church, not as leaders. Mr. O'Reilly goes into this by looking at St. Thomas Aquinas on vows and the Code of Canon Law of 1983. According to Mr. O'Reilly's research, quote, Three things stand out to me from St. Thomas Aquinas. God commands that one shalt do as thou hast promised, and that God will require the vow to be fulfilled, and if one does not keep it, it shall be imputed to thee for a sin. There are quite a number of verses on vows in the Old Testament, similar to that cited by St. Thomas Aquinas. For example, when you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He had no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin. Do not protest to the temple messenger, my vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? See Ecclesiasticus chapter 5, verses 4 to 6. Also, similar verbiage is found in the book of Numbers. If any man make a vow to the Lord, or bind himself by an oath, he shall not make his word void, but shall fulfill all that he promised. See Numbers chapter 30, verse 3. The 1983 Code of Canon Law, echoing St. Thomas Aquinas in Scripture, says of a vow, A vow that is a deliberate and free promise made to God about a possible and better good must be fulfilled by reason of the virtue of religion. See Canon 1191. End quote. So, it is a matter of religion to follow the vow. Was Father or Cardinal Bergoglio at either time in, in his life dispensed from it? When being merely a priest in Argentina, if John Paul II wanted him to be a bishop and commanded him to accept his place in the episcopacy, then clearly he'd be dispensed from the vow, and I'm pretty sure John Paul II knew about that vow. Now, this will not make many people happy, but it's not my job to make you happy. But what about at the conclave? Mr. O'Reilly gives us this, quote, Therefore, in light of all the above, I find the question regarding the dispensation of the Jesuit vows taken by Jorge Bergoglio, S.J., an intriguing one. Having thus framed the question, for the remainder of the article, I will use sources friendly to Pope Francis. Austin Ivray, Gerald O'Connor, Theodore McCarrick, Father James Martin, S.J., and Matt Spots, S.J. Austin Ivray tells us that Cardinal Bergoglio was approached at the 2013 conclave by those who worked on his behalf to get him elevated to the papacy. Speaking to the effort to elevate Cardinal Bergoglio in 2013, Mr. Ivray's account is quoted in an article in the Telegraph. Quote, Spotting their moment, the initiative was now seized by the European reformers, who in 2005 had pushed for Bergoglio. Mr. Ivory, who once served as Cardinal Murphy O'Connor's press secretary, explains in the book, They had learnt their lessons from 2005, Mr. Ivory explains. They first secured Bergoglio's assent. Asked if he was willing, he said that he believed that at this time of crisis for the church, no cardinal could refuse if asked. Murphy O'Connor knowingly warned him to be careful, and that it was his turn now, and was told, Capisco, I understand. Then they got to work, touring the cardinal's dinners to promote their man, arguing that his age, 76, should no longer be considered an obstacle, given that popes could resign. Having understood from 2005 the dynamics of a conclave, they knew that the opinions traveled to those who made a strong showing out of the gate. End quote. Sound familiar? It's why I started with the story that says Francis was only doing what was agreed upon at the conclave. He was approached by several now-deceased cardinals to run the church precisely in the manner it is now being run, including, and most especially, Traditionis Custodis and Amoris Laetitia. In fact, his attitude about oaths, if this is true, is very much reflected in Amoris Laetitia, for when you receive the nuptial sacrament, you make an oath as well. But this goes further. Mr. O'Reilly just comes out and says it. Quote, However, Jorge Bergoglio S.J. was bound by a vow, unless previously dispensed from it, not to ambition for any office in the church of which the papacy assuredly is one. Yet Mr. Ivere informs the cardinals campaigning for him first secured Bergoglio's assent. On the face of it, taking Mr. Ivere as a truthful source, it appears that Jorge Bergoglio S.J. clearly violated one of his Jesuit vows. That is, unless he had been previously dispensed from it with regard to the 2013 conclave. End quote. Later, Mr. O'Reilly reminds us that Father Hardin says that every Jesuit must resist such a call to attain any office, and it's clear that then Cardinal Bergoglio did not do so. So, is Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano correct here? Is Francis a breaker of oaths? That's an important question because according to the law of the church, it's a major mortal sin, which comes with a lot of associated questions. And I don't like asking these questions, but I have to. So let me know what you think about this in the comments, please. And I'll ask everyone to keep this civil because it's an important topic to discuss. 
If you want the channel or website with the Vegano Plays list of talks, it'll be in the sources blog, return to tradition.org, or just go to Irby at Orby Communications, which should be on your screen for those watching here on YouTube. They have all of the, his tapes there for you. But let me know what you think of this in the comments, please, and like and subscribe if you haven't. It really does help. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.